so welcome. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you here this evening to the law school. Uh, and it's fitting, I'm Kim Brooks, the dean here at the school, it's fitting that we start our uh, series of public lectures with Archie. And uh, Archie came into my office very early on in my deanship and in his characteristic way, very casually suggested that it would be a good idea for us to contemplate doing a lecture series about law for the public in an effort to make the law more accessible and to bring people into the law building and to get a chance to engage a little more actively in the community. Indeed, not only did we have, uh, was it a good idea that we might do this, but in fact we might conceive of it as an obligation of the law school in terms of giving back to the community. And it was immediately apparent to me that this was a good idea, but we were not so sure whether our colleagues would be similarly persuaded. And within about an hour of sending out an email canvassing suggestions, we had more than 20 offers from our colleagues to provide similar lectures. So the plan is that there will be another five lectures following tonight's as part of this series in this winter term, and then we'll do a similar similar series next year that will feature other of our colleagues. Um, tonight's lecture, Dilemmas in Canadian Sentencing Law, is sure to be engaging. I'm sure the other lectures will be similarly engaging. For those of you who may have caught Archie on an, any number of the uh, radio shows he did this week to talk about this issue, you'll have seen that it is one that, uh, that provokes a wide range of responses, and so we hope that you'll be able to engage actively with him at the conclusion of the lecture. The, um, I might just say a few things about Archie before turning over the floor to him. Uh, Archie is an extraordinary human being. Um, one of the most uh, remarkable things about him is at his core, he is committed to equality and social justice and the pursuit of a balanced life in a way that is um, astonishing, moving, and inspiring for those of us who have the opportunity to work with him here at the law school. Certainly I've learned a great deal from him already in my first couple of months uh, in office. He takes very seriously the well-being of others and that fits nicely in some ways into the topic that he's chosen to address tonight. We have a tradition here at the law school that we call the Weldon Tradition of Unselfish Public Service, named after our first dean, Richard Weldon. And if there is someone who embodies that spirit, uh, it would be Archie. And so in some ways, again, it's kind of fitting that he uh, opens this series about law for the public. I hope that you enjoy this evening. We're delighted that you've come. Again, there are an additional five lectures uh, on Wednesday, uh, Thursday evenings uh, through the course of the term. Um, there are also some comment sheets to get people's feedback about how this format has worked and whether there, you have other suggestions. And if you'd leave them on the table before you leave tonight, that would be terrific. This is coffee and cookies for people here, so should you feel the need to just get a bit of refreshment, please feel free to do so. Enjoy. Well, good evening. Uh, after the Dean's very kind introduction. I'm afraid it's all downhill for me from here. Uh, so perhaps I ought not to open my mouth uh, at this point. Um, but uh, uh, I do have quite a bit to say, actually. And, and I first of all want to thank you most sincerely for coming out on the inaugural uh, um, lecture in our series, intended for the public. Um, we appreciate your interest. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll bring in some of your friends and family. Uh, and we hope that we'll be able to offer uh, something more to the public than we usually do by way of uh, lectures and, and opportunities for engagement. Um, I. Uh, I chose t tonight's topic uh, uh, of the many I might have thought about lecturing about simply because it's one that many people fasten on uh, uh, quite readily. You know, they hear about uh, issues surrounding the sentencing of persons convicted of criminal offenses. Uh, they often develop uh, opinions quickly, um, and uh, sometimes those opinions are singularly misguided uh, in terms of basic principles and in terms of desired outcomes. Uh, so I know it's a controversial area, but I thought it uh, would be uh, worthwhile to try to provide an overview of sentencing within the criminal justice system uh, and to give you some sense of how you might make an informed judgment about the kinds of cases you hear of daily in the news media. So that was my intention. So. This first slide actually encapsulates not only my talk, but uh, you know, my outlook on many sentencing issues. Um, this is not a, a topic where you know, very easily there's you know, a, a right way, 
um, that uh, is pointed to in a wrong way, and they tell you how long it's going to take. You know, the idea that's involved in criminal sentencing is trying to find a fit sentence for antisocial activity uh, which has deeply harmed an individual or society or both. And it's not easy to find your way through it. Um, that's why opinions vary so widely. That's why some people manage to uh, miss the mark completely in terms of understanding criminal sentencing and others perhaps are a bit closer to uh, co the contemporary legal reality in Canada. I'm going to try to present the latter to you. The contemporary legal reality. I make uh, every possible uh, mistake when I do uh, uh, PowerPoint. I put too much text <laughs> and it's too busy, but I make up for it because I have copies for everyone to take home, right? So, so that uh, you, know, you will have a little take home uh, piece. You don't have to read this religiously. I'll cover the topic uh, and then you can read later on at, at your leisure. Uh, but you know, I do mean to, to identify here some of the things that I'm going to cover tonight. Dilemmas do abound in Canadian criminal sentencing um, and we've responded in varying ways over our history. So I'll first talk a little bit about the history of criminal sentencing in general and in Canada. Uh, then I'm going to try to engage with the theme of what we think causes crime and how our sentencing policies and practices relate to theories on the causation of crime. It's sometimes a difficult connection to make, but it's a necessary one. I'll then speak about the prospects for change in societal behavior through criminal sentencing and the elusiveness uh, of that connection. I'll talk about Canada currently, you know, and I'll ask and answer the question of whether we're experiencing a crisis in the rate of criminal offenses that requires a dramatic change in sentencing policy. I'll discuss what institutions control Canadian sentencing law. Where does sentencing law come from? It doesn't come from the heavens. Uh, what are the justifications for sentencing and on what theory does our justice system rely? I'll talk about what Parliament and the judiciary say are the purposes of sentencing and the kinds of factors that aggravate or mitigate a sentence because all sentencing has to be individualized. I'll talk about sentencing tools that the criminal code makes available to judges and in the final analysis I'll you know, ask us all to think about does Canadian sentencing law policy and practice attain a high level of legitimacy among the Canadian public and also if Canadians had a better understanding of the law would their outlook on sentencing change. I'm really trying to contribute to the, the last point there. There are lots of themes that I'm not going to address tonight, uh, which are you know, certainly um, sheltered under the general subject of uh, judicial uh, or, or uh, tribunal-based uh, uh, dispositions or sentencing of persons. I'm not going to be dealing with sentencing under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. I'm not going to be dealing with the special dispositional regime that obtains following verdicts of not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder or unfit to stand trial. I'm not going to be dealing with post-judicial sentencing issues involving corrections and community supervision. I'm not going to be dealing with resolution discussions and outcomes or plea bargaining, although that's extremely important in the justice system. And I'm not going to be dealing with restorative justice procedure and programs. Those are all significant topics that you really should try to get a grasp of if you want to you know, appreciate the wider contours of uh, uh, the justice system with respect to criminal matters. But I can't cover them all. So that's a subject for another lecture. If I don't bomb out completely and the dean permits me to do this again, perhaps I'll take that on the next time. Um, so, next I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the history uh, of uh, criminal sentencing. And the first image is quite jarring and intentionally so because our history both internationally and within Canada has been a punitive one, uh, one that we ought not to be uh, uh, proud of in any manner whatsoever. Canada you know, has uh, used the same kinds of uh, sentencing techniques that are exemplified by this graphic image. Looked at more broadly, the historical range of punishment has comprehended a whole range of awful things to do to our fellow human beings when they're convicted of criminal offenses. We, you know, over the centuries, and this is uh, with respect to sentencing in Canada, the US, Western Europe particularly, I'm addressing, we've imposed banishment or exile or transportation, harsh physical punishment, mutilation, branding, flogging, whipping, torture, death of course by burning, hanging, burying alive or drowning, forfeiture of land and, and property, forced labor, orders for compensation, denial of the status of citizen, imprisonment and fines which we still have and many other intrusions upon liberty. This actually is a, a graphic depiction of, of uh, um, you know, physical forms of punishing here in Canada. 
And this nicely, or awfully, you know, combines uh, both the pillory at the top and the whipping post uh, at the bottom. You know, that's part of our Canadian tradition as well. So we can't disassociate ourselves, you know, from this kind of cruelty towards others. Canada's history of sentencing? Well, before our first criminal code of 1892, there was widespread use of capital punishment, many forms of corporal punishment, including here as well, as I mentioned, whipping, branding, and the pillory, fines, transportation, imprisonment. When Confederation came in 1867, we concentrated the uh, criminal law power in the federal government, and we split responsibility for jails between the uh, levels of uh, government as a major change at that point. Our criminal code only existed uh, from 1892, and it was a partial codification of the common law with respect to criminal justice issues. It still had a focus on capital punishment, but for a smaller range of offenses, and it also used imprisonment heavily. It vested discretionary powers to imp impose sentences in the judiciary, and it imposed varying maxima, sometimes quite unpredictably, um, you know, if you look at the old code. It removed some common law penalties, such as forfeiture, but it retained whipping as a possible punishment, permitted fines for some offenses, it allowed some conditional forms of release that uh, resemble uh, probation. In terms of major changes since 1892, our criminal law in the sentencing domain uh, has uh, introduced inter indeterminate sentences for long-term or dangerous offenders in 1947, um, which we still retain. Uh, it abolished the death penalty only in 1976 and substituted mandatory life sentences uh, for murder as that kind of partial exchange within Parliament. There was an incremental growth of probation starting in 1921. We didn't end whipping until 1972. You know, whipping, whipping was imposed up to 1972 for the crime of rape and perhaps other offenses. Um, in 1972, we also introduced uh, conditional and absolute discharges um, and uh, intermittent jail sentences of up to 90 days accompanied by probation. Uh, in the 1970s, we introduced community service orders as a condition of probation, and uh, the, created, the creation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms had a significant, uh, but uh, not uh, fundamental, influence on the, uh, our sentencing law. The major change in Canadian sentencing has actually occurred in, in 1996, you know, 104 years you know, after the promulgation of our criminal code in 1892. And this was actually the first attempt by Parliament uh, to uh, uh, codify major sentencing principles and, and procedures. Before that, it was a mishmash of mainly judge-made law. So the uh, 1996 reforms authorized adult diversion and encouraged restorative justice principles. It created the conditional sentence of imprisonment, which I'll be explaining to you later on, but which has been hugely controversial, although well-intentioned and I think largely successful. It proclaimed the purpose and objectives uh, of sentencing for the first time by Parliament. Before that, you had to meander through the cases to figure out why we were actually sentencing people and uh, what we expected to accomplish. Um, these reforms were intended to reduce reliance on imprisonment uh, within Canada. So that's a sort of broad spectrum outlook uh, on uh, uh, the history of criminal penalties in general and, and in Canada. I'm next going to, to turn and look briefly at the causation of crime and its uh, relevance uh, to uh, sentencing, uh, because there ought to be a connection between what we think causes crime and how we're responding to it within uh, criminal sentencing. There are many outlooks on causation if you read the textbooks in criminology and if you, you know, kind of can extract you know, the threads of insight from the cases on what causes crime. The classical criminological school says people make rational choices, they're, they're accountable, they show a lack of self-control, they reject authority and it results in crime, and offenders are morally defective and we can deter them by coercive penalties. This is still the most influential explanation and the most frequently referred to in sentencing, particularly connected to the retributive or moral justification for sentencing. There are other theories as to why people commit crimes. The biological explanation, well, it's a matter of you know, what's within you in, in a physiological sense. The psychological explanation, a whole range of uh, theories which relate to personality traits that are said to influence criminal behavior. A group of sociological and social process uh, uh, perspectives, perhaps more apt you know, for a, a criminology class today, but overall you know, what they cover uh, are uh, reasons for crime that relate to social disorganizations, subcultural norms, conflicts between valued goals and diminished opportunities for some groups, antisocial values. Um, from a social process perspective, labeling for crime is seen as the key societal uh, choice. Um, 
and uh, some at-risk individuals might be contained by positive influences, but weak social bonds cause resort to criminality, crimes against women are a function of gender inequality, and society is inherently conflictual and structural inequalities make the poor into criminals. So that's a whole cluster of social process and sociological explanations which do, I think, explain in part the nature of crime, but which the system seldom acknowledges, because if you took on these kinds of explanations, you'd be more interested in crime prevention rather than reaction to persons who are found uh, guilty of offenses and then punishing them. I next want to look at what's happening in, in crime in, in Canada now. You know, what, are, what are the current uh, trends in Canadian uh, criminal justice statistics? Well, it's positive on the whole, although you wouldn't think that when you listen to the politicized debate at the federal level with respect to criminal justice issues. The volume and severity of police reported crime has continued to decline over at least the last decade as it has for about the last 20 years. So that's from the most recent uh, you know, report uh, from Statistics Canada. The number and seriousness of youth crimes has been declining since 2001, although some youth violent crimes are, are, rates are higher now than they were 10 years ago. Adult violent crime is also generally down, although for select offenses, the, the uh, rates of offenses are slightly higher, such as, for example, attempted murder and firearms offenses. Break-ins and vehicle thefts have, have been steadily decreasing, and impaired driving, on the other hand, has gone up for three years in a row, which is more a function of detection, I think, than incidence of the, the behavior. So the overall statistics that you'll see, if you look at Juristat uh, online, you know, with respect to uh, Canadian criminal justice statistics, are quite productive and encouraging. You know, they tell us uh, that uh, this is a less dangerous society to live in in terms of the likelihood of being subjected to criminal offenses than it has been for about two and a half decades. But on the other hand, federal penitentiaries are beginning an expansion process. The government is spending $2.1 billion to add 2,700 beds beds, they call them, it's quite a peculiar notion, isn't it? You know, cells for, in, uh, for uh, prisoners over the next five years. As CBC says, to accommodate an expected growth in the prison population from tougher sentencing provisions. So notwithstanding you know, the uh, statistics you know, for crime, which are positive, you know, we are expanding, on the other hand, the punitive uh, state. So uh, we'll see more institutions like this, which is a Quebec uh, penitentiary with you know, its classical uh, axes uh, you know, around the central uh, part uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, the prison. So huge institutions uh, with enormous capacity to uh, incarcerate people. And we'll see more of this double bunking in uncomfortable cells and more of this tiers uh, of cells where people are housed like animals in cages. So, in the midst of all this, you might think, well, why are we doing this? And the answer I don't have, not from an evidentiary perspective, not from a good public policy perspective, not from a criminological perspective, not from the perspective of a lawyer or a scholar in criminal law. It's for reasons outside all those domains that we're doing this. Um, Indeed, the research uh, with respect to the relationship between the severity of offenses and influencing the, the uh, incidence of offenses is quite conclusive. And what it tells us is that um, the presumed linearity uh, between increasing sentences and reducing crime in some criminological schools is simply unsupported by the evidence. This influential article by the uh, Ontario criminologist Dube and, and Webster um, says basically this. It's on a meta uh, uh, an, uh, analysis that they concluded it. But basically they say variation in sentence severity does not cause variation in, in uh, crime rates. Indeed, if harsher sentences were to cause people to offend less, there'd have to be a number of intermediate steps that simply don't occur in most uh, situations of criminality. Individuals have to believe it's likely they'll be caught and punished. Individuals have to know the punishment, right? They'd have to be people like me who read the criminal code and the cases. Individuals have to consider the consequences of their crime and they'd have to weigh the levels of punishment available in deciding whether to offend. They'd have to do a kind of cost accountant, cost benefit analysis. Should I offend? If I offend, what's the tariff going to be? And so on. We know people don't do that. The only offenders who are likely to do that would be, frankly, people like me. If I were a lawyer who was going to steal from my clients, then I might do a calculation about the likelihood of getting caught, what the kind of punishment I would uh, get in the final analysis would be, and how much money I could get away with. But I'm not a typical offender, and 
I don't have any trust monies anyway, so you don't need to worry. Uh, uh, but the typical offender, therefore, doesn't do this kind of cost-benefit uh, analysis. The Correctional Service of Canada itself, that runs the prisons of this country, says it's a myth that increasing the severity of sentences will deter criminals from offending. The reality is that certainty of punishment may exert a greater deterrent effect than does severity of punishment. So, and this next uh, image is a contemporary one from California, you know, where this uh, uh, state, you know, has had a burgeoning criminal justice system, particularly on the imprisonment side, for decades. And you have situations like this, you know, where people are, I don't know whether you, this is well beyond double bunking. <laughs> you know, this is an institution where people are crowded in at levels which we should all be ashamed of. But where now even California, despite its penchant for incarcerating people, says, we can't afford this anymore. We've got to stop incarcerating people. We've got to release them. Maybe we should legalize the production and distribution of marijuana as a way of cutting down the number of persons in institutions and dealing with our uh, Californian deficit. But uh, if we turn in this direction, I can assure you we'll have you know, no real offsetting public benefit. Next, I'm going to look at some sources of uh, Canadian sentencing law, so you'll understand better um, you know, what are the, uh, the parents, as it were, of Canadian sentencing law. First of all, there's the federal parliament that, you know, that uh, has exclusive authority over criminal law and procedure, as I mentioned, from the, what we used to call the British North America Act 1867, um, you know, which uh, allocated authority over uh, uh, criminal law and procedure to the parliament. Parliament sets maximum penalties for true criminal offenses subject to the sentencing judge's discretion to choose the mode and extent of uh, sanction. There has been emerging from our federal parliament as part of this new wave, this new punitive wave, a recent tendency to stipulate more minimum mandatory sentences for more offenses rather than leaving it in the judge's discretion. So Parliament is one of the major sources of uh, uh, our law on sentencing. So too is the judiciary. The judiciary, through its trial judges principally, have the discretion to decide what punishment should be imposed, with some exceptions. And the criminal code provides direction in principle by stating the purpose of sentencing, and judges interpret its provisions. The common law, or judge-made law as we call it, clarifies the purposes of sentencing, and it also examines aggravating and mitigating factors in order to determine the final sentence for an individual. Provincial appellate courts set the usual range of sentences. They can interfere uh, for uh, uh, reasons uh, that are uh, um you know, rarely used, but the appellate courts usually defer to trial judges as they impose a sentence, unless the trial judge has given an unfit sentence or makes a, a significant error in principle. And the Supreme Court of Canada itself has considered several sentencing appeals since the 1990s, uh, amendments of the uh, Criminal Code. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms is another um, quasi-source, let's say, of uh, sentencing law in Canada. Uh, it's been more important for its uh, declaration of procedural rights, uh, such as the right to counsel uh, and the principles of fundamental justice. It does have one pr uh, provision, Section 12, which specifically forbids cruel and unusual punishment or treatment. Um, and uh, it's in only in circumstances where the, uh, uh, the gravity of the offense, the circumstances of the offender, and the offense are considered, and the court determined that, oh, the punishment here is grossly disproportionate. Um, this happens rarely. You know, usually if there's an error in sentencing principle, uh, principle a provincial appellate court, or more rarely the Supreme Court of Canada will intervene without referring to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Next, I'm going to look at some of the basic justifications uh, that are, are spoken to uh, in the cases and the scholarly literature for sentencing. Why do we actually sentence? I talked before about causation of crime. You know, I'm now going to look at what are the specific uh, uh, justifications that are offered in the cases and the scholarly literature for the, the sentencing process. Well, first of all, um, you know, there is the retributive or moral justification. You know, where so, the so-called evil choice uh, theory. Offenders have made free choices to do evil, therefore they deserve to be hated because they're morally accountable individuals. And in a civilized society, this repudiation is expressed through punishment that's imposed by the state on the individual. State punishment is thought to annul the wrong, to uh, reassert community values, and restore societal equilibrium. So that's the retributive or moral justification or evil choice theory. 
Next, so this is very influential in, in uh, our, our justice system. Similarly, you know, the range of justifications that shelter under the utilitarian or consequentialist justifications you know, are also important. In this uh, uh, vein, what we do is we sentence offenders in a manner which will maximize the utility or benefit of society. The idea is we sentence people to further broad social goals, um, and the offender's interests are not primary concerns. Indeed, the offender's interests uh, and the interests of society may be you know, quite con conflicted. Um, and uh, 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 there you know, is often an argument about what's best to do for the individual compared to what's best to do uh, for society. I should tell you uh, uh, that uh, uh, when I tried to find images you know, that would help to liven up you know, my over-textualization of my PowerPoint, I did a, the typical Google search of images, and it's hard to find images for um, abstract concepts. It's easy for prisons, but hard to find them for abstract concepts. So I just innocently typed in evil choice, because I thought, well, <laughs> that would uh, provide you know, an image, perhaps, uh, that uh, might illustrate my talk um, in a, a, a suitable manner. The next image is honest to God. <laughs> you know, this is what came up, um, and uh, I just pass it along. I don't explain it. I don't justify it. Um, <laughs> So I don't know whether there's a gremlin in my computer uh, or whether it's the devil that's made me share this with you tonight, uh, but that is what happened when I Googled evil choice images. Uh, Jordy, we may have to edit this from the, uh, uh, from the evening's presentation. In terms of other theories of uh, uh, punishment, you know, there is also the communicative uh, theory. Now, this is the notion where we say punishment emerges from our culture and it influences culture. So what we're talking about is punishment as an institution through which society defines and expresses itself. And this, this is how we define ourselves in a way. And, you know, it seems strange, but sometimes we do it through punishment. Criminal justice policy discussions, therefore, according to Manson, engage deeply held and broadly influential attitudes that are only partly about crime. And maybe that explains, you know, at least in some measure, the current federal political debate about crime uh, and uh, punishment. But they're also about ideology, morality, religion, class, and rule. If you face this openly, you know, then maybe it's still possible to have a productive debate, but you can understand that these kinds of communicative theories can be both positive and negative in their effects. Usually people don't separate out you know, the moral or retributive and the consequentialist or utilitarian and the communicative theories when they're actually engaged in sentencing. Usually it's a mixed approach that the courts use rather implicitly. As Ruby says, it's difficult to separate the views of punishment except on a theoretical level. And the courts acknowledge at the bottom of, of this slide, the courts acknowledge that um, all uh, considerations in sentencing you know, should, n n uh, of those, none of them can be excluded from the legitimate purview of legislative or judicial decisions. Decisions. So sentencing sort of borrows from you know, utilitarianism, from moral retributivism, you know, from uh, communication theory in some kind of rough melange. I'm just going to mention briefly in the next slide something I said I wouldn't, but it perhaps is the new, uh, one of the new waves of sentencing, although it's a long way from uh, taking over. Um, our criminal code, as I mentioned in 1996, was altered to provide for alternative measures. And there's a whole range of criminal code provisions that provide the legislative framework for diverting accused away from the usual processes of the justice system, and wherein courts are empowered to dismiss charges for accused or complete or partially complete alternative measures. And these programs are established uh, uh, by the provinces. So people can be diverted using our criminal code since 1996. Um, if uh, the uh, disposition is still consistent with the protection of society and it's appropriate having regard to the needs of the person and the interests of society and the victim. You know, so you know, there is, the stage has been set for alternative measures, but I'm not covering that tonight because I'm dealing with conventional criminal sentencing you know, that a judge has to impose uh, when somebody is convicted, either after a trial or, or he or she pleads guilty. So I'm going to skip over then to the overall approach uh, uh, to uh, sentencing. How is it that a judge gets uh, uh, to uh, uh, Im impose a sentence? What's the methodology that's used in addition to the principles? Well, a judge has to consider all sentencing principles um, and balance them. 
you know, he or she has to take into account, in a sense, the whole world, although in some cases one factor may be dominant and it may be obvious that it's dominant from the outset. But theoretically, at least, a judge should open his or her eyes to the full range of sentencing principles and decide what's the right balance to reach. We also have to understand sentencing as an inherently individualized uh, uh, process. We're not sentencing an, somebody in the abstract. We're sentencing an actual human being for having done an actual crime in a certain situation, you know, with a certain kind of background. Sentences are also governed by the principle of restraint. And this is where public understanding and public comment often goes off the rails. You know, where you know, what you may hear in reaction to some sentences um, decries the restraint of the justice system. You don't want a system, largely speaking, that imposes the maximum sentence on everyone all the time. You want judges to be restrained, and that's what they're commanded to be under the law that was proclaimed by the Parliament of Canada, and that was previously exemplified by the common law before 1996. So when I talk about the principle of restraint, you know, the law says there shall be no deprivation uh, of liberty if less restrictive sanctions may be appropriate, and there shall be no incarceration before considering all available, available sanctions other than imprisonment. You know, so that, you know, that's a, a command for judges to be restrained when they Im impose uh, intrusions upon liberty. As well as another aspect of the restraint that the criminal justice system imposes, all sentences have to be proportionate to the gravity of the offense and the degree of responsibility of the offender. How serious is the offense and how responsible is the offender for bringing it about? And finally, in terms of the overall approach to sentences, sentences have to be comparable with respect to similar crimes and similar offenders, right? You can't have uneven or disparate sentences without justification. There should be rough comparability among sentences. Next I'll turn you know, to uh, parliamentary and judicial statements of purposes and principle. You know, what the Parliament of Canada has said are the governing principles and then to some extent how the judiciary interprets them, just so you'll have some idea of what the overall principles are. And by the way, just so you'll listen, even though you're not going to write an exam. Um, I had to think about how to engage you in the sentencing discussion. So after I finish talking about the law, I have two cases that I want you to deliberate on and think about what you would impose as a sentence. Um, so that uh, I'm going to ask you to subdivide into groups and buzz around you know, in your heads you know, what you think the outcome should be and then share it with us. Um, so that um, you know, you'll see how difficult it can be you know, to reach a fit sentence uh, for an offender. Now you're all paying attention, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so what do Parliament and the judiciary say are the purposes uh, of uh, uh, sentencing? Um, there, are, there are several criminal code provisions that since 1996 established the purposes and principles of, of sentencing. Um, and then of course, you know, they govern unless the, uh, in every situation, the common law, unless it's inconsistent you know, with parliamentary declarations, um, still ha has some real relevance. So the common law fills in the gaps you know, of parliament, but the parliamentary statement in a, a, a country where parliament is supreme subject to the constitution, the parliamentary statement uh, really does does uh, uh, structure judges' approaches to sentencing now. It's not radically different than what the judiciary was already imposing anyway, so this wasn't a, a revolutionary thing. Section 718 of the Criminal Code says that the overall purpose of sentencing in Canada is to contribute to respect for the law and the maintenance of a just, peaceful, and safe society by imposing just sanctions with one or more objectives. Now, right at the outset, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Gladue case acknowledged that sentencing, it's an adversarial and accusatorial process. Sentencing involves a conflict between the interests of the state, as expressed through the aims that I'm about to share with you of separation, deterrence, and denunciation, and the interests of the individual offender, as expressed through the aim of re rehabilitation. So the purposes of sentencing are in conflict with one another when it comes to deciding for an individual you know, what he or she shall receive. So, Parliament says that one major purpose of sentencing then is to denounce unlawful conduct. And the cases say what we mean by that, by the use of the pr principle of denunciation, is to communicate society's condemnation of the offender's uh, conduct. It's a symbolic collective statement that the offender's conduct should be punished for encroaching on our basic uh, code of values. So we denounce people through sentencing. We also and although the mechanism here may be obscure and ineffective, we also try to deter both this accused and other people. 
We make it clear to the offender and to other persons with similar impulses that if they yield to them, you know, these impulses, they will meet with severe punishment. We're trying to discourage the offender and others from engaging in criminal conduct, although even the courts, as well as the criminologists, say the deterrent effect of incarceration is either uncertain or quite unproven. Next, uh, we uh, have as a, an important principle uh, of uh, sentencing separation from society where necessary. I said it before, it's a, a, as a last resort, but we do incarcerate people. That's what they mean by separation. It's a euphemism, uh, but that's what we mean by, by separation, <coughs> where incarceration leads to the complete separation of offenders. And we justify uh, in, incapacitation on the basis that the offender who is, in, who is incarcerated is not likely to be deterred regardless of, of the sentence otherwise. <coughs> the sentences, as I, I mentioned, <coughs> are intended to assist in rehabilitation. This is where we think about the individual offender and how to bring him or her back into the community. <coughs> Pardon me. I taught until three in my criminal procedure class. I don't think I have any of my students here, but uh, uh, the voice after a while may give out a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, we try to assist in rehabilitation, to rehabilitate or, or heal the offender. This is premised on the so-called medical model of punishment, where offenders can be treated and cured of their criminal tendencies. The aim of re the rehabilitation principle is to enable people to come back to become constructive members of the community rather than violators of its laws. And of course, the next slide illustrates you know, offender's enthusiasm for this. The offender loves rehabilitation because in a, rehabilita a sentence that's um, dictated principally by the rehabilitative principle, we know what we're concerned about is bringing you back into conformity with society's values. We're interested in you and what will benefit you and help you conform again. There are other uh, principles of sentencing that Parliament specifies that are still, broadly speaking, in the rehabilitative domain. There's the concept of reparation to victims and the community at requiring the offender to the extent possible to return the victim or society to the position it was in before the offence. And also, Parliament says, we try to promote the sense of responsibility in offenders and acknowledge the harm done. It, too, is another a restorative objective, seeking to remedy the adverse effects of crime in a manner that, illust that addresses the needs of all parties involved by this notion of encouraging a sense of responsibility, we're trying to encourage people to accept their role in injuring the specific victim and the larger society. There is also, not specified by the criminal code, but added on by the Supreme Court of Canada um, in a, a group of cases, the principle of retribution. This is essentially the, you know, a principle that relates, as I mentioned earlier, to the morality uh, or, or the immorality of the offender's uh, uh, behavior. So this is not specified in the code, but it is an accepted principle of sentencing. So in addition to advancing utilitarian considerations related to deterrence and rehabilitation, punishment should also be in imposed to sanction the moral culpability of the offender. The Supreme Court said that you know, this notion of retribution is an important unifying principle, and what it provides is an objective, reasoned, and measured determination of an appropriate punishment, uh, which properly reflects the moral culpability of the effect, offender having regard to his or her intentional risk-taking and the consequential harm, the general normative character of the offender's conduct, what it was that the offender had in mind when he or she caused the, the, the crime. Now, this is not intended to be vengeance. The Supreme Court has said this bears little relation to vengeance, which has no role to play. Vengeance represents an uncalibrated act of harm upon another, frequently motivated by emotion or anger as a reprisal. And we have to understand that a lot of the reactions we see uh, to sentencing imposed by judges are vengeful. You know, they, they are, understandably, you know, the desire to harm somebody who has harmed somebody else, particularly in cases of personal violence, but in other instances uh, as well. But that's not a principle of sentencing. Looking at the person's moral culpability is, but just trying to harm them in the old eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth uh, way is not what our law permits. There are additional sentencing principles that are part of our criminal law as well uh, through the criminal code. And some of these 
although now codified within the criminal code, you know, have always been part of the law that judges imposed. For example, if you offend against a child or a police officer or a justice system participant with respect to certain offenses at least, uh, denunciation and deterrence are emphasized. Whenever an offender hears a judge talking about at the start denunciation and deterrence, you brace yourself, unless there's something else you know, that will help moderate the judge's sentence. In terms of other uh, code-specified principles, uh, there is a fundamental principle, which I mentioned before, proportionality in terms of the gravity of the offense and the degree of responsibility of the offender. But other principles, uh, sort of in a miscellaneous bunch, are stated. There are certain instances which are statutorily recorded as being aggravating circumstances, offenses that are motivated by bias, prejudice, or hatred. Um, you know, if, if the crime is simply uh, intended to hurt somebody else for discriminatory reasons, if you abuse your spouse, House, if you abuse a person under 18, if you abuse a position of trust, as a doctor, a lawyer, you know, perhaps a parent, somebody you know, who has taken advantage of a relationship of dependence and trust, or if you benefit a criminal organization, or if you engage in terrorism. Another important principle I mentioned before, similarity among offenders, offenses and crimes. Um, there are some other declaratory provisions that combined sentences should not be too harsh. You know, if you have 200 criminal, uh, sorry, 200 criminal convictions, but all for credit card fraud, they're not going to sentence you 200 times one year in jail, right? The, you look at the totality of the sentence and say in combination it still should not be, you don't deserve 200 years for 200 uh, criminal uh, offenses dealing with credit cards. We don't deprive of liberty if less restrictive measures are available. We consider sanctions other than jail in every instance. Offenses in, uh, uh, involving organizations require special consideration. And overall, punishment, as I mentioned, is in the judge's discretion. So that brings us to the end of the sort of principles at a broad level that a judge has to consider before he or she starts individuating a sentence, before he or she says, OK, I now know what I think are the broad principles that Parliament and other judges have said should govern here. Now I have to look at this specific offender in this specific context. So next we turn to um, issues that involve aggravating and mitigating factors in individual instances. Now, um, these are very particular to the accused um, and uh, to the particular offense. This is no exhaustive list. Although I mentioned a couple of statutorily proclaimed aggravating factors, this is a typical common law list. Um, you know, I would normally discuss them if I were in a class on a, a longer basis, but you can see how some of these factors, if present, ought to aggravate a person's sentence. If you uh, plan a, an offense over an extended period of time and you deliberate upon it, as opposed to committing it impulsively. Or if you use violence, cruelty, or brutality in the commission of the offense. You not only hold up the store, but you pistol whip you know, the, uh, uh, the lone clerk at night. You use a weapon. The prevalence of the offense can aggravate at times. Obviously, if you have previous convictions, that can you know, escalate your sentence. If you continue the offense for an extended period or if there are multiple offenses over a shorter period, you repeat the offense even though you had the chance to stop your offending. If there are multiple victims, if the victims are particularly vulnerable, uh, if the victim um, had a role in the justice system and you offended against him or her, if your offense involves a criminal organization or a terrorist organization, if you commit an offense while you're on bail or parole or probation, you know, while the courts have already tried to assert control over you, you defy the courts, essentially. We look at the motive of the accused, and we saw some bad motives before. We look at the extent of harm caused. We look at abuse of trust. We mentioned that from the criminal code. We look at the character of the accused and whether he or she is disreputable. We also look at post-offense conduct as possible aggravating factors. Fortunately, most accused have something that can mitigate sentence. Uh, having been a de criminal defense lawyer before, it's not always easy to find something that mitigates, but usually you can look at the person's circumstances in a sympathetic way and try to get the judge to think about you know, how to moderate the penalty that might otherwise obtain. So these are some obvious mitigating factors. If you're a very youthful or a very old offender, if you're, the first, if you're a first offender uh, or there's been a long gap since your last offense, if you're otherwise of good character, if you've had, you know, shown previously a pr social stability, if you pleaded guilty, you know, you, you, you've uh, spared the victim, spared the state, you know, a protracted uh, trial, uh, you get some benefit from that. 
if there's other evidence of acceptance of responsibility, you know, immediate resignation from an organization, you know, where you, you, know, you used your position you know, to uh, benefit you in a criminal way, uh, or immediate offers of compensation you know, th through uh, appropriate mechanisms. If you had a failed, perhaps, but relevant defense. Uh, you know, so it was almost self-defense, but the judge rejected it in the circumstances. That might be an instance. If you have a background of social deprivation, the judge might consider that as mi being mitigating in some circumstances, although so many offenders have a background of social deprivation that you know, it may not distinguish you particularly. If you're intoxicated at the time of the commission of the offense, if you cooperated with the justice system, you've helped recover the stolen property, you've assisted the investigators in, uh, uh, in finding you know, others involved. If there are prior examples by you of exemplary conduct, you save six people from that burning building. That'll stay with you for a while for certain offenses. Um, if it's a case of first impression, the judges didn't really know what to do because this kind of case hasn't come on before. If you had a praiseworthy motive, you know, you were guilty of the offense of theft, but you stole the bread for your children in situations of desperation. You had poor physical or mental health. Uh, you experience other sanctions due to the uh, offense. You're kicked out of the Real Estate uh, Dealers Association. You no longer can trade on the stock market. Simple mercy, you know, which most of us don't have to define. What's the effect of, on your family of uh, the offense and your sentence? If you're a person who shows compulsive or addictive behavior, um, if the Crown or police misbehave, that's a kind of strange way of putting it. If, if the Crown or police abuse their powers uh, in uh, you know, the course of the investigation or, or the trial, that can help mitigate in certain limited circumstances. Um, if the law might uh, change or is in the process of changing. You know, if uh, Prime Minister Harper says tomorrow he's changed his mind about personal possession of marijuana and he will introduce a bill on April Fool's Day this year uh, that will decriminalize personal possession of marijuana. A judge might well take that into account in imposing sentences on accused between now and April 1st, knowing that the law is in the process of changing. But you can see this is not an exhaustive uh, list of mitigating factors, nor was the list of aggravating factors. It's up to the lawyer's ingenuity, the client's individuality, you know, to try to uh, you know, provide either mitigating factors or from the Crown's perspective to identify appropriate aggravating factors. The Criminal Code also includes, and we don't need to talk about this here, but I would in criminal law or criminal procedure, extensive uh, statements about how criminal sentencing is to be done. What, is, what are the procedural and evidentiary uh, contours of criminal sentencing? So next I'm going to move to the forms of punishment. What kinds of sanctions are, are available uh, for uh, uh, judges to impose and in what kinds of circumstances are they available? Parliament has specified a whole range of sanctions that judges can impose uh, in uh, appropriate circumstances. In some ways, many consider the absolute and conditional discharge uh, the most lenient of uh, the uh, uh, judicially imposed sentences. An absolute or conditional discharge is intended to provide the power to relieve against both the fact and the stigma of a cr criminal conviction. It's a useful signal to the public. And the judiciary is effectively saying, well, we think that you should be discharged absolutely here ultimately. Um, it does require a finding of guilt, but the offender is deemed not to have been convicted. Um, so there's no record of a criminal conviction, although there is technically still a record of the finding and the disposition. The, crowd, the court has the discretion to order conditional or absolute discharges if it's in the best interest of the accused and not contrary to the public interest. Um, so that's the conditional or absolute uh, uh, discharge. Next we have the possibility of a probation order and intermittent sentences. Um, Probation is imposed in several different circumstances. Um, it involves a suspension of the sentence or perhaps an additional sanction or to perhaps provide community controls for offenders who serve intermittent sentences. If you're sentenced to up to 90 days of imprisonment, you can serve it uh, intermittently, you know, a few days at a time and then you're released. And while you're released when you're not in jail, you know, then you're subject to a probation order. So probation can be used in each one of these circumstances. If you breach a condition of your probation, that may result in an application for variation or a revocation of your sentence and a resentencing or a new, and also a new charge of failure to comply with a probation order. 
There are certain uh, pr probationary conditions that are, are compulsory. They are part of every probation order. Keep the peace be and be of good behavior, appear at court, notify if your address changes. And then there's a whole range of optional probation order conditions which the Crown and the defense and the judge can tailor to suit the individual's circumstances. Maybe to report regularly, to remain within the jurisdiction, to abstain from uh, uh, intoxicating substances, to, to support your dependents, to engage in community service, to uh, uh, go to a treatment program that you agree to attend and participate in, or other reasonable conditions. Orders may be changed uh, by the court, and if there's a new conviction while you're on probation, that can result in a revocation of the probation order and a resentencing, and also failure to comply is, is a, a new uh, 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 separate uh, offense. The next image maybe captures the combination of the intermittent sentence with probation. As I say, it's not easy to find images that capture these, but I kind of liked it. You're in jail on the weekend, and then you know, you're into the community and living happily, but with probation governing uh, your, uh, uh, your uh, living in the community when you're not serving your time. Fines are available um, that uh, may supplement or take the place of other sanctions. They're not supposed to be imposed as like a tax on the poor on persons who can't pay. Um, because uh, if you are poor and a fine is imposed, you, know, you have to be able to participate in a fine option program or the judge will take into account your penury um, and provide a, a, a reduced fine that you can afford. Uh, Clayton Ruby says one of, this is one of the most common means of dealing with crime and the court may fine a person in addition to other sanctions. The court has to be satisfied of your ability to pay and you may be imprisoned in, in default of, of payment. Now, as I recall, the maximum uh, current fine for a summary conviction or the less serious offenses is $5,000 in Canada now and it's unlimited for indictable offenses in appropriate circumstances. So, you know, you could get, although littering isn't a criminal offense, um, you could get a $1,000 fine and maybe it would deter you from littering. I don't know, I don't know what that tells us about criminal sentencing but again it's a, a, an image that may help us understand. There are also possibilities of providing restitution to victims. It's, it's encouraged by the criminal code, the new statement of sentencing principles. Um, the judge can order limited compensation through the criminal process. He or she can't include pain and suffering or general damages. So it's not you know, the substitution for a civil action. It is still considered a form of punishment in addition to any other measure imposed, and it may benefit the victim and demonstrate that the accused is taking responsibility. So it can be ordered in addition to other measures for your property loss as a victim, your expenses for bodily or psychological harm, for relocation of family and expenses. The next sentence which a judge may levy in appropriate circumstances, the conditional sentence of imprisonment. This is intended to only capture conduct that's serious enough to attract a sentence of incarceration, but not so severe as to warrant a penitentiary term. If you serve a term in penitentiary, that means you're sentenced to two years or more in a federal penitentiary. So it can't be that serious, but it still means that you ought to be put in jail, but you can serve your sentence in the community. So the conditional sentence of imprisonment was enacted to both reduce reliance on incarceration and to increase the use of principles of restorative justice. It has both punitive and rehabilitative aspects, and it generally includes punitive conditions. House arrest, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, should be the norm. So that's you know, what most people use as a synonym you know, for a uh, conditional sentence. No offenses are excluded except ones you know, which uh, Parliament has said you know, can no longer be the subject uh, of a conditional sentence. So, so there has been some encroachment uh, since the Pruel case from the Supreme Court of Canada in 2000 by Parliament on the range of offenses that can be subject you know, to a conditional sentence of imprisonment and, and it's been reduced so fewer offenses can be uh, subject to post arrest. But the Supreme Court says this is better than incarceration at achieving uh, uh, restorative uh, uh, objectives. And sentences may be ordered to be served in the community um, uh, in the, those circumstances where there's no danger to the community and it's broadly consistent with sentencing principles that I've outlined before. Um, there are probation-like mandatory and optional conditions that apply when you're serving a sentence in the community. And if a breach occurs, that can result sometimes in no action, if you, perhaps you've got a good excuse, can result in changes of condition, can result in a suspension of the order, uh, perhaps a termination of the conditional sentence of imprisonment and jail. Now obviously, Canadian judges and Parliament intend that some offenders in some circumstances can be subject to imprisonment. 
Um, the Supreme Court of Canada said in the Gludu case now 11 years ago that this is overused in Canada. Canada is a world leader in putting people in prison. Um, in fact, in the Gludu case, the Supreme Court noted that we are second only to the United States in industrial nations in terms of our rates of the use of the imprisonment uh, sanction. So that compared to Western Europe, uh, New Zealand and Australia, we put more people in jail for longer periods of time for more offenses. Um, the uh, Supreme Court said over-incarceration is a long-standing problem, and it's particularly so for Aboriginal Canadians, you know, where there's a huge over-representation in prisons. Ruby says that imposing a term of imprisonment of the proper length is very difficult. No set of rules can do justice to the complexity of the task. And basically here, to make a long story short, Parliament says what the maximum penalty is, um, and the judge is able to sentence within the confines of the sentencing principles and options that we talked about up to the maximum sentence. Um, so, you know, if you serve two years or more, uh, then it's in a federal penitentiary, less than two years in a provincial jail. The judge may delay your parole eligibility date in certain circumstances. This criminal code also defines what a life term may be, and it talks about murderers being able to apply under the so-called faint hope clause for relief from imprisonment after 15 years. There are also rarely used, but nonetheless still important, provisions for dangerous offenders and long-term offenders. You know, this is a, a departure from some of, most of the other sentencing uh, regimes that we've talked about. Um, these uh, uh, mechanisms are available where the normal determinate or you know, fixed term sentences uh, provisions, they're inadequate given the level of threat to the life, safety and physical or physical or mental well-being of other persons or where there's a likelihood of causing injury, pain or other evil through failure to control your sexual impulses. Um, so the Crown can make, uh, if it advises in advance, a, a dangerous offender off, uh, application uh, where a person has been convicted of a serious personal injury of, uh, offense um, and where the person uh, may be a threat to the life or safety or mental well-being, uh, uh, physical or mental well-being of others based on evidence. The potential effect of a dangerous offender designation is to impose an indeterminate sentence, i.e. you're in jail basically until you're no longer dangerous, or a definite sentence but one which includes long-term supervision. If the Crown fails in a dangerous offender application, it can still result in long-term offender status. A long-term offender uh, 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 provision or application involves an assessment procedure and the courts being satisfied that a sentence of more than two years is necessary where there's a substantial risk of reoffending, but the risk may be able to be controlled. And the effect is to impose a sentence of at least two years plus up to 10 years of, of uh, supervision. So that's the basic range uh, of uh, um, sentencing options that a judge has to choose from based upon the principles and factors that I mentioned. Every kind of sentence can, uh, outcome can be appealed, including dangerous offender and long-term offender verdicts. All conventional sentences can be appealed. Summary conviction uh, sentences, that is the offenses uh, that res are lesser in nature, uh, but where the uh, accused or the Crown thinks that the penalty is inappropriate. And appellants may be released pending the sentencing appeal. So that's the basic outline of sentencing law in Canada. Now, I hasten to say at this moment, you may say, to your, because you may be saying to yourselves, this man is just an apologist for the criminal justice system. I don't see myself that way. Uh, indeed, you know, I have been an active critic of many aspects of the criminal uh, justice system, um, and uh, I still write uh, articles and speak publicly about problems that I see within the, the uh, justice system. Um, and uh, as a, 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 a friend of mine who is a, a prof the other day when, when he was going over one of my articles said, well, you know, this is both a sad and a good time, you know, for uh, uh, law professors. It, it's sad because there's so much to complain about and criticize. It's good because there's a lot to complain about and criticize. So I don't mean to say by my outlining, you know, the principles and factors and sentencing and so on that we've by, we have by any means whatsoever reached, you know, the zenith, you know, of uh, criminal justice, the best practices standard of criminal justice uh, systems in, in our country. There is a lot that's wrong. But on the other hand, there's so much misunderstanding that you know, I have presented this in a fairly uncritical fashion to help you understand.
So I'm next going to turn to, you know, and we've got, you know, well, you can go anytime you want. I have no power to detain you. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'd like to turn now to, uh, um, you know, the sentencing exercises that I suggested might be productive for you to think about what you would do, you know, were you a judge. So you are all now commissioned as newly appointed uh, uh, trial judges. Congratulations on your appointments. You all richly deserved it, and you didn't get it as a result of patronage. Um, you got it on merit exclusively. Um, so I'd like you to divide yourselves. I said into groups of three, you know, three or whatever seems natural, and select one member of your group to be a reporter. And I'm going to give you case summaries. I'll give you them in hard copy form so you can look at them, but I'll go over them. You know, and basically, consider the case summary. Decide what you believe is a fit sentence. Compose some very brief reasons. And you know, here you're going to have to work fast. Take no more than five minutes. And if chosen, we, I don't know how many groups we'll be able to hear from, but I'd like you to tell the audience about your decision on sentence, discuss your choice of the form and extent of punishment, and give the reasons, um, and, then, and deliver your own decision. So that's what I'd like you to do. You don't have to participate. You can be a silent judge. You can just say, <laughs> I concur with the other judges on, on my bench, if you wish. So you can be this kind of judge, you know, 60 year old plus you know, guy in the British legal system with a, a wig, you know, who's presumably, you know, at, at, in the normal course, uh, at least in the past, been a small c, you know, conservative. Um, or you can be this kind of judge, elegant, um, thoughtful, perfectly balanced, uh, and wholly impartial, you know, thinking about only what's right to do in the circumstances. Or you can be some other kind of judge uh, in, the, in the middle, I don't know. This is the first one, R versus Jones. Um, Ms. Jones pleads guilty, pleads guilty, you know, to importing cocaine under Section 6.1 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. This is a very serious indictable offense for which a person is liable to imprisonment for life. The circumstances of this offense, she's arrested at the airport after arriving on a flight from Jamaica, but she's immediately taken to hospital because the customs officer notices physical signs consistent with swallowing narcotics where the containers had leaked. She's treated in critical condition for cocaine intoxication, but she recovers fully. She had swallowed 93 petals, uh, pellets uh, containing cocaine before leaving Jamaica. Total of 465 grams, worth about $75,000, where her fee was five. The offender that I'm depicting here for you is a 28-year-old single mother of three children with no prior criminal record, a grade 10 education, limited employment history, few employment skills or employable skills, supporting her family through social, social assistance, in therapy for emotional trauma, trauma for physical abuse by her former spouse. She maintains she committed the offense, her first involvement in such activity owing to financial hardship and desperation for her children. The typical sentence you know, for uh, uh, similar uh, offenses is uh, uh, rarely a conditional sentence of imprisonment, which I've explained. So that's possible in exceptional circumstances. Far more regularly, the individual gets two years less a day of imprisonment plus probation, or up to four years of regular incarceration for an offense in the typical range. So. And she's Canadian. She is, yes. So we're not thinking about uh, deportation or anything like that. Um, you know, so, because that would be an additional sanction which a judge would consider. So, collaborate now for, you know, five minutes uh, and try to reach a sentence and try to, you know, provide reasons and then share it. Uh, at, at this rate, uh, none of you are going to get federal judicial appointments in your training, <laughs> because you have the wrong attitude to criminal justice. Well, I, I don't know how much time you have. I, I kind of want to roll. You know, I, I might get you know, the uh, uh, ever ready money or whatever it is. I, I'm, I'm happy to do another exercise. Do you want to try that? Just one more? Yeah, but what is the dry sentence today? What is the dry sentence? <laughs> Is, is very often you get right or wrong. The truth is, for a time like this, that it is extremely <coughs> rare uh, that somebody would receive a conditional sentence of imprisonment. Most of the facts of this case were actually taken from a case that you can read online from the Ontario courts. It's called Board, B-O-R-D-E versus Hamilton, um, where a trial judge gave a conditional sentence of imprisonment. The Court of Appeal said we won't interfere with the sentence in this case because she served most of her time in the community on a conditional sentence. But they said, you know, we would not have permitted this. 
you know, we would have sentenced her to a term of custody in a federal penitentiary. So there is, in terms of what's right and what's wrong, you can look at that case and you can think about what's right or wrong. The trial judge gave a 115-page decision deconstructing the drug swallower you know, as a courier um, and thinking about the issue of deterrence and poverty and, and so on, a whole range of factors. The Court of Appeals said, oh, he went too far. He conducted himself as if he were a ro rolling royal commission and the sentence was too lenient. Yeah. You know, so more typically, our courts would be saying you know, that it would be a term of federal in, uh, incarceration. Yes? I just want to make the point that the judge who wrote that 115 page decision was a prosecutor. That's right. Yes, his name was Hill, as I recall. Casey Hill. Casey Hill. Uh, and uh, it was quite an innovative and very controversial decision at the time because you know the, the usual range of punishment you know, was definitely a federal term of incarceration for offenders like this. What was the verdict? I'm sorry. What did you get? She got uh, a conditional sentence of imprisonment and probation, just as all of you, you did at the trial level. But uh, again, the courts of appeal were far harder than that. Let's look at one more case then. Um, this one, you know, it, it's uh, you know at the, at the next one at page fifty-four of your materials. This is a, a case that, that's perhaps more challenging for you. Mr. Smith being found guilty at his trial of breaking and entering a dwelling house and committing the offense of theft in it, contrary to the criminal code. Um, and the section three forty-eight one says that it's an aggravating offense where the accused knew the dwelling house was occupied. So this is a home invasion break and enter, right? Not a garden variety unoccupied house. This is home invasion. The circumstances of the offense: the accused uh, or the the offender was arrested at a random check stop for impaired drivers just after the commission of the offense. When the officer shone a flashlight into the back of the delivery van and noticed several weapons and ski masks in plain view, they just weren't very good criminals. <laughs> Smith and another as yet unidentified person, both masked, broke into a home at night, tied up the two adult occupants, threatened both in order to get the combination of their gun safe, and then stole several shotguns and pistols. Neither victim was, was physically injured, although they were both emotionally traumatized for a few weeks. The offender is a 35-year-old father of two children living with and supporting his family. He has two prior offenses, one for mischief or damage to property at age 19, so 16 years ago where he got a conditional discharge, and another for common assault at age 25 where he got a $500 fine. He has one year community college certificate in drywalling. And he's described in his pre-sentence report as an excellent parent, a dutiful spouse, a kind neighbor, a hard worker. He's been hearing impaired since birth, but he's in excellent health. He's a recovering alcoholic. He's been sober for 10 years. He's a survivor of abuse as a youth in the school for the deaf. His explanation, I fell in with a bad crowd and I was influenced by the bad crowd. I committed the offense in the hope of reselling the weapons for a quick profit. He's extremely remorseful. He's fearful about the implications of the sentence for his family. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a wide range of punishment for the offense of home invasion. The lowest penalties have included an intermittent sentence of 90 days of imprisonment plus two years of probation in quite exceptional circumstances. The most severe sentences have been in the 10 to 15 year range. So there's a very wide range of sentencing. It is an exacerbating circumstance that it was a home invasion as opposed to a break in into a regular dwelling. But on the other hand, so to confer again. Think about what you believe is the appropriate sentence you know, for this home invader with a partial explanation. Go ahead, think about it. Okay, I think it's now time for justice to be done. Uh, so, um, let me just uh, say a couple of things before I ask you to report your uh, decisions. Um, first of all, uh, I'm sure like my students, you'll rush out of the classroom when we're finished. And so first of all, I'd like to thank you most sincerely again you know, for coming out tonight to, at this inaugural uh, lecture in our series. Uh, I'd also like to think, uh, thank uh, Jordy, who at the back here has uh, provided you know, the uh, uh, recording, which will be used for posterity minus uh, the Sarah Penn uh, uh, shop. Uh, and uh, to Elizabeth, you know, who uh, basically has organized this evening uh, and the other uh, in the series. So uh, thank you so much to both of you for uh, helping us put this together tonight.